this mobile home, that's when it's back to the lab again, yo. This old rap city better go capture this moment and hope it don't do better. All right, what we're going to talk about today is the experiment that you'll do with the lab portion of the course relating to kinetics, the topic that we've been spending our time on recently. That specifically is a reaction of ammonium persulfate, S2O8, and potassium iodide. Now, before we get too far into this, those are completely ionized in water. So we have the ammonium cation, the persulfate anion, potassium cation, iodide anion, as far as the cations, they are spectators, so we really don't care about them. We're not going to discuss them further, just that they have no active part in the reaction. So we're going to write this for the rest of this lab and the rest of this video as the anions doing most of the work and occasionally producing neutral compounds. So the reaction question is right here. The persulfate anion reacts with two iodide anions to give us two sulfate anions and a molecule of iodine diatomic iodine. I've drawn, the I've drawn the dot structures out here because this is actually an electron transfer reaction. We're seeing the iodines with an extra electron as anions, and we're seeing the persulfate with a peroxide linkage in the middle, an oxygen to an oxygen, and we don't see that in the final issue. So what we have is the breakage of that bond between the two oxygens, the formation of a new bond between the two iodines and some electrons being shifted around. One from each of the iodines to one of each of the oxygens that used to make up that bond in the center. Along with that primary reaction, we have a number of other pieces of the puzzle. That is our slow reaction, so that's the one we're going to be studying in terms of rate. However, in and of itself, we can't visualize it, so we have to deal with something else to, use, uh, to give us an indicator that the reaction is actually done. There are a couple of side reactions that we're going to deal with that are important but still not visualizable. The first one is the iodine we just produced reacts with iodide ions to generate a periodide, you know, a triiodide ion. Um, that's a very fast reaction, but it's not one that's helpful. Now the next one is something we have to add intentionally, and that is the thiosulfate anion reacts with the triiodide anion to produce the tetrathionate anion, S4O6, and three iodides. That also doesn't help us, but that is our limiting reagent problem. It's a very fast reaction, but once that's used up, the thiosulfate, the S2O3 anion, once that's actually used up, then the triiodide anion remains in place, and we have a secondary reaction that we put in there, a little bit of starch, which forms a very dark navy, almost black color, if it gets into contact with the triiodide anion. Um, that reaction is fast, but it is actually a lot slower than reaction number three, so it doesn't compete. But it will tell us virtually instantly once the thiosulfate, the S2O3 anion, is actually used up. So this will be our indicator. Okay, so as before, the general rate, rate law looks like this. The initial rate is equal to the rate constant at a given temperature and the concentrations of the reactants raised to reaction orders. Very key component to remember here, those reaction orders do not have to, and in this case do not, actually correspond to the balanced equation. I'm sort of giving you an answer before we work it out, but they are not going to match the balanced equation. The initial rate that we're going to have is going to be calculated from how much thiosulfate we had in place. So remember I said that's our indicator, and the time it takes for that color change to show up. The others are the reaction orders, X for the persulfate anion, which will work out from trials 1 through 4 by holding the iodide concentration constant. The Y, which will work out from trials 5 through 8 by holding the persulfate concentration constant. And then K, which will go back to each trial after we've worked out X and Y and solve for in every trial, and then we'll average that out for the eight trials that we're going to do at room temperature, roughly 25 degrees C in the lab. Okay, but before we do that, we have to go back in time a little bit, things that people tend to forget when doing this experiment. And that is that if you add a solvent to your reagents, you do not have the same concentration anymore. So this is the generic form of the dilution equation. 
and that is that for any concentration in molarity and its volume, we know the number of moles. But when we're diluting something, we're not changing the number of moles. So the, the number of moles of solute is the same if we just add water to a solution. The solute is still there. We didn't change the amount of that. So because that hasn't changed, we have the dilution equation in its general form, which is molarity times volume initially is equal to the new molarity times the new volume finally. And so generally this is used when you're adding a solvent or unreactive, comp, you know, unreactive solution to your original. We can rewrite that using the final molarity as one of the terms and the final volume. Since the final volume is identical for every one of them, then we just need some initial concentration. Those are standbys, those we can write down as soon as we walk in the lab. They should be, and they will be for this example, uh, 0.20 molar for the persulfate anion. Uh, 0.20 molar for the iodide anion, and 0.012 molar for the thiosulfate anion. That again is our limiting one, that's our indicator problem. When that runs out, we'll see the color change. So every trial, the total that we're going to do is 19 milliliters. So we know the final volume for everything. We know the initial concentrations for everything. So all we have to work out based on the data in the experiment which gives us the initial volumes of each one of these that we're going to use in each trial, is what their concentration is in each trial. Because we can't use the bottle concentration to correspond to what's in the reaction since the reaction's been diluted out. So here's what that looks like. The first trial we have, putting back up the initial rate equation, had 8 mils of 0.20 molar per sulfate anion, 4 mils of 0.2 molar iodide anion, and one mil of 0.012 molar thiosulfate anion. Something worth noting here is that that one, the last one, the thiosulfate, are used up before we see a color change reagent, is the exact same amount of the exact same concentration all the way through the experiment. So again, looking at that final volume, we, have, we can rearrange this to get our new molarity as the original concentration times the original volume, in all cases divided by 19 milliliters. So, for the initial persulfate concentration, it looks like this. And we work it out, we end up with 0.084, roughly, molar concentration. We do the same thing for the iodide concentration, for the same reasons. When it's diluted out to the 19 mils, we're still on trial one here. We get a concentration of roughly 0.042. And this is the critical one, the thiosulfate anion the one that's going to act as part of our indicator system, we don't change the amount in this in any trial. So this number is the controlling number for what we're going to, what we're going to use as our initial rates. And we'll talk about how we do that in just a moment. But we end up with a concentration of that at the start of the reaction in the flask after we've added everything of 6.32 times 10 to the minus 4 molar. All right, now here are those reactions again. The only one here that's actually limiting us, since we're going to be changing concentrations of the original two reactants, is reaction number three, which is where our thiosulfate comes in. Once that gets used up, we're going to see a color change and that's going to let us work out some kinetic parameters. That doesn't mean that the original reaction is complete. It can't be. We're not using the same amount stoichiometrically all the way through, so there's going to be mismatches in most of the cases we're dealing with. This one has to be limiting. So you notice it was much lower in concentration initially. That's going to give us the information we want to see. Okay, so how we're going to actually do that, our initial rate will be once that thiosulfate, that lowest concentration one, runs out. And the data collection in this experiment is going to be a stopwatch. You're going to be timing how long it takes for these, these two solutions, once you mix them, to go from clear to that dark navy blue, almost black color. Or, if you're doing one that's very slow, the first traces of light blue that you see. That's going to be related in all trials to, to the rate constant, the persulfate concentration to its reaction order, and the iodide concentration to its reaction order. Okay, so they're all going to start out with that same change in concentration for the thiosulfate because that's going to run out entirely. So that number doesn't change. So we're going to have a, a constant number divided by our time of the color change, and we're going to relate that to the initial concentration. So this is the instantaneous or initial rates method of doing this, and it's the only way we can really do it. So if we go back to that first trial, and I'll put, up, I'll put up sample data from several years ago for two, the first two trials we did. Uh, the first one, the color changed at roughly 38 seconds. Second trial, roughly 77 seconds. 
So I've worked out what the rates are based on that. So I'm taking that concentration change, dividing it by those times. Here are the numbers I get for the initial rate for each trial. And you're going to have to do this for all 16 trials, four different data sheets. The first two are at room temperature just to, to figure out what X, Y, and K are. The, the third set is temperature trials. And the fourth set is a catalyst one, which you'll compare back to the others, but it's not a linear relationship. Here's what that looks like in equation terms. We put that in. Both of them are equal to the same rate constant times the concentrations with their, action, their orders in place. But the reason that we do kinetics trials the way we do is that we can put them in ratios to each other, like I've shown here, and cancel out a lot of the variables. You notice we held one of the concentrations constant. It's gone now. We don't have to worry about that. The rate constant, as long as we don't change the temperature, cancels out. It's gone too. And we can do a little bit of a mathematical simplification with the top there. And that is, we can actually look at that as an intentional doubling or halving, depending which direction you're talking about, of the concentration. So 2 times the 0.0412. And we can pull that out as 2 to the x, leaving the original 0.042 in the brackets raised to the x power. And that will then cancel out. So we're going to get, when we're done, an equation that says 2 to the x equals somewhere really close to 2. Very important here. This is experimental data. This is not hypothetical stuff from the back of the book. So these are not going to be perfect. Error happens, okay? Somebody's going to have to stop, watch a second late, a second early. You're going to have errors here. So we're going to do a lot of trials to try and average that out. But here's mathematically how you deal with each one of them. You don't just assume that it's 1, because clearly it's not exactly 1. You take the log of both sides, that pulls out the exponent as a multiplier, and then you can solve for it. So in this case, it happens to work out very close to 1, it's 1 1.02 roughly. We can assume that's 1. Reaction orders tend to be integers, or they tend to be half integers. So we're not going to have a 0.01 reaction order. That doesn't happen, doesn't exist. So we can say that something that's, you know, a rounding error from 1 is going to be 1. It is an integer value. We can take that. But the number may get better if you average in all the other trials. I haven't put those in here because otherwise we're just sort of making this a little lengthy. We don't need that. We now have one of our, vari our variables out of the way. We can start looking at the others. Really, we don't have to hold the per sulfate concentration constant because we know it's reaction order. So we could actually just do the math. But just to be consistent, and in case we did it wrong, We'll leave its concentration alone so that we know it cancels out regardless of whether we were right or wrong about that exponent in the same way we did before. So here's sample data for trials 5 and 6 and the rates that derive from them. Exactly the same way we did before, no different at all. Then we're going to put that in place exactly the same way we did before with the various concentrations and the reaction orders and the rate constant. Then we're going to cancel things out as a ratio exactly the same way we did before. The rate constant goes, the concentration of the per sulfate goes, and we're left with a very simple version that comes out as 2 to the y equals, but this time notice it's not quite 2. Now, this is what I meant earlier when I said experimental error happens here. And it's why it's very important to average the data out over multiple trials. So here we end up with a y value that's not quite 1. It's not perfect. So that's kind of low. I mean, this is, you can tell it's off. There is no 0.8 reaction order, so it's probably 1. We could round it up to the nearest integer. It's closer to that than the 1 half, which is the only other typical thing that's not an integer for reaction orders. But the data here is questionable. I don't like that. Um, as, as an experimenter, I, you know, even if I didn't know it was supposed to happen, if I get something that's that far off of an integer, I'm concerned that maybe one of those trials is wrong. Hopefully, with the whole set in place, that would average out. In actual fact, it does, but you'll see this when you do your own data. It will or it won't. It ends up being first order. So now we have both reaction orders. We can calculate initial rate for every trial. You will have done that before you get here. Then you can basically rearrange that equation. What you should be doing is averaging all those trials out as ratios to get you average values of x, or you could graph it. Same for average values of y, or you could graph it. And then, after all of that, You'll also have eight separate values for the rate constant. Average those, and you've got something that's probably pretty reasonable at room temperature. Now, having our labs be the way they are, you'll know that's kind of funny, because you've probably experienced that room temperature tends to fluctuate seriously in the lab sometimes. Generally, we're not going to be talking about a two or three degree change making huge differences here, but 
you will have a thermometer at all times near you to work out what room temperature is. So if it changes drastically, then those numbers are not going to be really good comparatively. So just be aware of that as you're working out writing this up. Okay, a few things that are duplicated. Trial 2 is the same as one of the ones in the second set. So trial 2 and trial 6 are identical. This is useful because generally we split the data up over multiple groups. If those two don't come out very close together, somebody's doing something wrong because they have exactly the same concentrations for everything. So if you don't see those numbers being very close to identical, somebody's doing it the wrong way or doing it differently and you need to be worried about their data. So it's one little piece of troubleshooting, especially if you split this over multiple groups, which I tend to do when I teach the lab. Um, when you're doing the temperature trials, also be aware, trial number three, done at room temperature or 25 degrees C roughly, is the same as trial 10, which trials 9 through 12 are temperature trials. So you can do that one again, or you can just keep the number. Unless you've got a drastic change in room temperature, there's no reason to do it again. Or you can use it as troubleshooting to see if they come out with the same value. The temperature trials, 9 through 12. The rate constant through the Arrhenius equation is related to the activation energy, and that's the only reason to do them, is to work out what the activation energy for the reaction actually is. But that's not a simple thing to do. Even with two data points, it's not great. We're going to have you do it with four. You're keeping the concentrations the same all the way through. So the reaction orders are already done. We know what they are. They're both one. Or they you know, should be one if you've gotten the numbers right. Then you do the temperature trials. But rather than doing two of them and comparing, we're going to actually graph them and do a trend line. Because the rate constant changes. So the only way we can do that is to take the natural log of both sides to get rid of that value of E. So that will invert the natural log and get rid of it on the right for the, the temperature term and give us the value of natural log of the rate constant on the left. So we can actually graph that and we come up with a linear relationship. And that is y, in this case, the natural log of k being the y values, is equal to b, which is the natural log of a, the Arrhenius constant, and mx, where m, the slope, is the energy, the energy of activation over the gas constant r, and the sign has changed. So it's a negative Ea over R is the slope of that line, and x is 1 over t. So you can, this one you have to graph. There's no other good way to do it. The others, solutions for the, rate, the reaction orders, you can do two trials at a time as a ratio, or you can do all four trials, graph it, and then solve for x that way. Generally, we do um, non-graphical methods for the first eight, and then we graphical solve this one for the next four because it's a lot easier to see what's going on. Uh, but that requires a lot of processing of the numbers, and that's not a good thing to do by hand. So in the next video, I'm going to put up details of how to do that using Excel and how to prepare the graph and how to work out what the numbers are from that because it's much easier and that's, that's much more realistic of how you would actually do the solution for the energy of activation. So that will be part two of this video coming later on this week.